It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, we have with us today a returning guest that the people loved him last time, uh, John E. O'Rourke. Uh, you can find his website at uh, John E. O'Rourke with no apostrophe dot com. Uh, you can check him out in person. You meet him down there at the Short Stories Bookstore in Madison, New Jersey, the 13th, where he's going to be promoting his brand new book. It's hot off the presses. Uh, over here, it's called uh, Mysteries, Millions, and Murder in North Jersey. Uh, he was here once before, if you remember, talking about Richard Beganwald, uh, the Jersey Shore thrill killer. Uh, we had him on once before. Say, hey, John O'Rourke, are you there? I am. Hi, Ed. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming back, John. Uh, remind the audience, though, who is John O'Rourke? I'm a uh, retired New Jersey State Trooper. I did 20, 26 years with the organization. Um, and I wrote two books about troopers who died in the line of duty. And then I uh, wrote the the Jersey Shore Throw Killer book you had just uh, previously mentioned. Yeah, good old Richard Beganwald. Any any new developments with him? Uh, no. Uh, I guess about maybe about a year ago, they discovered bones underneath the uh, front porch of a uh, apartment where he was staying. And that made uh, local news around here because they were wondering what kind of bones they were. They turned out to be... Uh, dog bones. Ah, but even still, man, I would still, uh, I wouldn't put that past him, you know? <laughs> uh, I, I think, that, I think they would have made that much better if they went in, uh, went into the uh, basement and dug down there. Cause they never, they never checked the basement out. And he was, he was known to bury victims uh, underneath the basement floor. Now, now, why do you think that is? Why don't they go back and check the basements of these places? That's a good question. Uh, I, I, you know, and I think it comes down to the case was solved, and uh, they they move on. They got their conviction, and they move on. If you recall, uh, in that case, the defense attorney actually uh, came forward and said he was going to give up twenty five bodies uh, to take the life, um, uh, the death sentence off the table. He plead he plead guilty to that, uh, disclosed to twenty five other bodies. And uh, it, you know, for a life sentence, and they turned it down. Hmm. So, I, I, yeah, I just think that they w w were looking to uh, the prosecute the case. They were they were done, and uh, they moved on. Fascinating, fascinating. That's a colorful uh, Lou Diamond from Staten Island, uh, who I knew Lou Diamond very well. As a matter of fact, he was the the, the, the best man uh, at the wedding of my attorney, Richard LaRosa. The audience might recall I told that story about Richard LaRosa uh, the night he died. Um, you know. God rest his soul, man. Richard Rose has passed on now, so I've felt a little funny about contacting uh, Lou Diamond since then. Uh, since they were so close, we must open that up, you know? Hey, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? Especially you start getting older, our age. It's just, you know, your friends, people are dying left and right, man. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. People are starting to check out. But uh, Lou Diamond is a, a very personable um, uh, individual, and uh, he loves to talk about the case, and he's a He's a well of knowledge. So, yeah, very, very colorful character. Yeah, I definitely should get him on the show. I gotta get off my. That he is. Yeah, I gotta get, gotta get back to work. Here. Get back, <laughs> get my act together over here. So now, what's going on with mystery millions and murder in North Jersey? We're not talking about the Sopranos, right? This is a, a Exxon. What's going on here? <laughs> Correct. This is this is uh, nonfiction, not fiction. This is a a case that happened in the spring of 1992. Um, in Morristown, New Jersey, uh, a Exxon mogul, a man named Sidney Riso, literally disappeared at the foot of his driveway. Um, an hour and a half later, they uh, discovered uh, a neighbor found his car running in a driveway with the door open, and he was nowhere to be found. And for 57 days, uh, they, they had no idea where he was. <clears throat> So, it, you know, kidnappings are rare, as you, as you know, especially in the United States. So this, this actually was, uh, was national news, and uh, it was very compelling. I was a young trooper at the time that this happened, and I had, believe it or not, I had, I had no involvement with, with this case, even though there was some state police involvement with the investigation. I basically uh, really come to discover the, the investigation. When I retired, when I started teaching situational awareness and security, this is a um, 
good case study in uh, situational awareness and understanding what, what victims do that make them targets and understanding the methodology of, uh, of criminals. Well, so let's, it's a let's get into that for a second. Pretty good then. story. Yeah, what did uh, what did Riso do uh, incorrectly? Well, he he had some as an Exxon. He was the international president of Exxon, so he had some kidnapping uh, training, and mostly that concern would be when they traveled abroad. Uh, back in, in the homeland, they would they would not take the precautions that they would when they were traveling. He had uh, been offered as as the international president. He could have had a security uh, driver uh, drive him, you know, uh, from work and you know from home to work every day. And he uh, turned it down. He was he was a, he was a normal guy, um, even though he was a man of wealth. He was uh, he was like the you know the guy next door, and everyone everyone liked him. They said he was personable. He was he was down to earth. So he liked to drive himself to work every day. But what made him a target? Is he was very systematic in what he did. Uh, you know, every morning he would he would the lights would come on in the house at the same time. The kitchen light would come on. Uh, you know, his wife would be making him breakfast. He'd be taking a shower. The garage door would open up at the same time, like clockwork. He'd drive down, and this is the key. So, the the case study part of this is that he was very systematic in what he did. And the kidnappers, believe it or not were a husband and wife team. He was an ex-cop from Hillside, New Jersey. His father was the deputy chief of Hillside, New Jersey. He got injured on a job, which caused him to get a disability pension. He began working. His name was Art Seal. He began working for Exxon. Okay. Corporate, corporation. So that's that's the connection right there. And he, he worked as a security supervisor and, and worked his way up to a um, a manager. Ten years later, he disconnects under under circumstances that he felt that he was he wasn't treated correctly from Exxon. He leaves with his wife to go to uh, Hilton Head to start a, a business on their own. He, he runs into financial ruin there. Everything they were overspending. They were they were really into the lavish uh, lifestyle. They were living above their means. So when they fell into financial ruin, he had blamed Exxon for that. So he started selecting, you know, uh, executives at Exxon that he wanted to kidnap. And believe, it, believe it or not, uh, Sidney Russell was not on that list. I, I think he was like number five on that list. So what they did, and it's not the understanding the methodology of people that are going to do this stuff. They go into a, a planning phase where they identify potential targets. And then they start doing some surveillance. So they surveilled these these five individuals. And what made Riso the target is he was he would, others would would be unsystematic. They would take different routes every day. Their their daily routines were hard to really um, to um, uh, lock down. Some took security uh, all the time. Some took security here and there. So you didn't really know. You couldn't really lock into a specific. Date to take the uh, to take the victim. Risa, on the other hand, didn't have security, and he was like clockwork. Every every morning, he would leave the same time, would drive the same route, come home the same route. So he he was identified uh, as a target. So and he was surveilled for months, for months, literally months on end. That they were following him, and they were actually jogging by uh, the wife would jog by the house. And uh, do some uh, surveillance while she was jogging to to see what was going on. Morning of his abduction. Well, let me ask you this first before we get to the morning of the abduction. Uh, since uh, Arthur Seal worked there at Exxon in the security department, is there any indication that maybe he had a, a, some kind of inside tips or sources that, that told him who had weak security and uh, who he should go after? He had, he had, he did have an Exxon uh, handbook. Uh, gave all addresses of where all the executives wow. lived, and the detailed information. So that was his, that was his uh, insight. I mean, even though it was ten years later, to, um, to to target these individuals that lived in New Jersey. He, uh, however, when he worked for Exxon, he did take part in the kidnapping and ransom ransom. Um, uh, procedures and policy development over at Exxon. So he had some insight into uh, what they would do and, and how the executives uh, reacted. So he, he actually knew that when they were on American soil, 
uh, very few executives really took the precautions that were necessary to uh, kind of thwart a uh, kidnapping or what, an abduction. What about when he was working with Exxon? Did he ever have any contact, a personal contact with Sidney Risa? He did. Oh. He did. He was, yeah, he did. He was, uh, for a while, he actually uh, drove uh, Sidney Risa. So he did. And at the, um, the annual party, Risa was very sociable. He'd come over to the security you know, now. Most of them were ex-cops and ex-FBI. They'd all sit at one table together, and he would come over, and he would, uh, you know, thank everyone for their help. So, yeah, he did know Art Seal. So now, so then if Art Seal uh, kidnapped Sidney Riso and they had met prior, he had to be planning to kill him all along then, right? He didn't plan to kill him. The, the, it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it was, a, it, it was a plot to kidnap, and, um, to get the money from Exxon. There was a case that happened uh, several years prior. Uh, Victor uh, Samuelson was kidnapped abroad, and the kidnappers had requested $14.5 million in that, um, in that incident. And Exxon ultimately ended up paying hmm. the, uh, the kidnappers. And he had insight into that. So he knew that, the, that Exxon would pay a high ransom demand. Okay, so tell us what happened, because I interrupted you before, the morning of the kidnapping. How'd it go? Well, it goes back to how I had mentioned about this being a, a, a case study and situational awareness and what, what to do and what not to do. Well, part of her routine was judging by the residents. So what, what they had identified is every morning he had a long driveway. He was 200, 250 feet long. He would drive down his driveway give or take a, a foot or two, position his vehicle. So all he had to do is open up his door and pick down, uh, pick up his newspaper. Mm. And then he, and then he would drive to work. So they, they said, okay, what we'll do is the morning of, we'll jog by their residence, this paper, forcing him to get out of his car. And then we'll take him at gunpoint. Okay. And that's exactly what happened. Now, now uh, Art Seal was by himself or his wife went with him to, to back him up? His his wife was with him. She was driving. They, were, they had rented a, a white uh, van, like, a, you know, a, a Conaline uh, van. And um, as – go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I didn't say anything. Oh, as as he got out of the car and and was walking over to get his newspaper, they slowly pulled up in the, in the, in the van, slid the, the back door open. Art Seal jumped out with a ski mask on and a gun and took him at gunpoint. And what they had, what they had and part of their, as I had mentioned about what kidnappers do, there's a, there's a planning and, and plotting phase. They have, they decided, and it was based on this uh, Sigelson case, that they were going to place him in a in a wooden box, very uh, reminiscent of a uh, coffin. It was about two and a half feet by six feet uh, in length. And um, Sidney Riso, uh, at first was, was complying with what they had required, you know, with, with their demands. And he was walking towards the van to get in. However, when, when he looked into the back of the van, he saw the wooden coffin like box. He refused to get in there and a struggle ensued. Okay. And in that struggle, he was accidentally shot in the arm. Okay. That's not so bad. So he, yeah. A little shot in the arm. That's yeah. not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. He was shot in the arm and then they, they bounced back and put him in the, in the box and then drove off. But in the haste, they forgot to drop the ransom note. Okay. <laughs> so that's why he would literally, that's why he literally disappeared from his driveway. When the authorities came on the scene, it was, he was just gone. It was no, 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 nothing will happen to him. Okay. And, and where did they take him to? Believe it or not. Uh, they, they took him to a storage facility about 30 to 30 to 45 minutes away from Morristown, New Jersey. They had rented a, um, a storage uh, shed, you know, it's like uh, to see along the highway. They, they rented a, uh, I think it was around 20 foot by 15 foot storage um, facility. And they put him in the back of the, uh, of the shed. Was there food and water inside the box there? No, what they did is they once they they stopped along the way at a um, at like a CVS 
or, or something, you know, like a CVS to pick up some gores and some peroxide. Okay. And so they opened up the, the box initially. They, they uh, tended to the wound, uh, pour, put some peroxide on it and rewrapped it. They ended up having to cut off his, his, uh, his watch because his arm was swelling from, from the, uh, from the bullet wound. <laughs> but then uh, they, they put him back in the box. He begged not to go back in the box, said, I'll, I'll comply, I'll do whatever you want, just don't put me back in the box. And they put him back in the box, and they had drilled holes in there for ox, you know, to let oxygen go, go in and out. But there's a number of, of factors involved which actually caused his demise. Uh, one, he was breathing in, in his own CO2. So by the time they came back uh, about 10 hours later, yeah, from breathing in his own carbon monoxide, he was he was he was, he was weak. Yeah. So he couldn't at that point he couldn't play if he wanted to, and they they gave him very little water, very little um, um, uh, first aid, and this was during the spring and it was a very, uh, weather was unseasonably uh, hot, and there was no ventilation within the shed. So the shed was heating up to over 100 degrees, and the, and the box inside the box with poor circulation and um, uh, the heat was just too much. He had a previous heart attack a, a few years prior to this incident. So uh, he died within uh, within that box. How old was uh, uh, Riso? 57. 57, that's my age. Oh my God. Uh, now, uh, yeah. yeah. Now, would, were they checking up on him though in those few days well, until he died? They did, but uh, hours would go by. Uh, eight, ten, ten hours uh, each day would go by, and all, all, all they would do was open it up. They w they wouldn't even let him out of the box to relieve himself, so he had to defecate uh, and relieve himself with inside the box. So, and, and and like I said, there was very little first aid given to him, and he would be allowed to take a sip of water, nothing more. So it, the, the conditions that they put him under were, were just unsurvivable and the the irony to it is they did a lot of, of planning they really they really did a lot of planning before they even started doing the surveillance of their potential victims so what would make them think that putting him under conditions that they put him under that a man would would survive a man in good health wouldn't survive under those conditions never never left someone who had a, a previous heart condition yeah, and once he had the gunshot wound to, on top of that. But now, now you're telling me that they brought him to like a storage unit, like like when you're moving or something like that, and you rent a storage unit that you drive up to it and you back up and you unload your car and you unload, and there's like units right next to each other, that kind of place. Correct. Correct. Now, aren't those kind of places they have people who work there and there's other people? Move, the people have businesses as they run out of there. They're unloading and driving around all day and all night. Uh, weren't there other people? Couldn't they hear this guy inside this box in there? Mm -hmm. uh, apparently not. It was it was a large enough uh, unit that that they put they put him in the back, so it was far far removed from from the door. They had bound and gagged him. He had he he couldn't move. It was, it was like he. Uh, that's why I said it was reminiscent of a coffin. There's, there wasn't a there wasn't a lot of move movement for him, so he can get you know get his bend his knees to maybe kick his way out. And it was it was constructed of uh, plywood and uh, metal metal hinges and and the padlock. So there was no way he was going to get out of the box. And he had very little movement. So uh, I no, I would say he, he probably provided very little sound was coming from from that unit while he was in there. That's just fascinating to me because people are so nosy uh, around those storage places, you know. And uh, we have them here in Vegas. They're everywhere. You're not. I remember back east though. On Staten Island, uh, me and my brother-in-law had invested in, in his business. It was uh, x-ray equipment. And we were always going to that storage unit all the time. And we would notice next door, the guy had a big fireworks stash. You know, he was running this fireworks operation. You know, <laughs> like you'd look at other people's storage units as you're driving by and you'd see they're up to stuff. It just amazes me that uh, he would, uh, a guy who was a cop in a security, in the security field, and then he would uh, rent a storage unit to keep a, a kidnap victim in it's just it just seems so amateur uh. yeah and and you're right it, it was uh on some uh, in, in some respects when they when we talk about ransom night you'll see that they actually really thought that out 
very well. And if executed uh, that night, they, they might've got away with it. Um, but yeah, on the other hand, thinking about how to maintain the, your, your asset, you know, your key to your key to your financial well being, if, if you will, in, in, in their, in their unrational way of thinking was Sidney Riesel. So why would he not, uh, you know, uh, be treated, you know, uh, of, um, in such a way that they're going to guarantee his well being in order to get their money. They didn't, so they they were they were disjointed in in the way they did things, and that and that ultimately ended up to their uh, their being caught. I, I want to take a commercial break, but before we, well, I tell you what, when, when we come back, I'll ask you this question: uh, Arthur Seal and his wife Irene, uh, during their their lifetime, were there any indications they were involved in other crimes or other kind of a heartless activity and, and stuff like that, or, or was this totally out of character? Uh, so let's take a commercial break, and then we'll get back. Uh, I'll ask you that question. Uh, we're talking here about the book. Um, Mystery, Millions, and Murder in North Jersey. And it's written by John E. O'Rourke. He's a former uh, New York, a New Jersey state trooper. Uh, wrote a fascinating book previously to this. I read the whole book cover to cover because I knew Richard Biegenwald. Uh, the Jersey Shore Thrill Killer, Richard Biegenwald, uh, True Crime. And also he writes some kind of stuff, uh, uh, training uh, manuals and stuff like that about the New Jersey uh, state troopers who were murdered in the line of duty. So Art Seal and Irene, did they have complaints, you know, of... Uh, uh, police brutality complaints, any kind of suspicious bribing stuff going on, any kind of violations or anything uh, in their background? Art Seal was a problematic cop uh, from the get go. Okay, but not ter- not in terms of of criminal uh, behavior, if you will, uh, of stealing things. He had a temper, okay. and he got he he had a lot of complaints internal investigations about him and was suspended several times. He, um, because his father was the assistant uh, chief of police. So a lot of, a lot of what he was doing was being covered up, but it finally boiled over into where, where officials couldn't, couldn't, um, cover it up any longer. And he, it was brought up a, n- a number of times on official charges. Okay, so that kind of makes sense. You know, if he's kind of a brutal guy, you know what I mean? And then he's, he shoots some guy and he's got him stuck in his box. He doesn't care. That that kind of... Uh, now, okay, they start... How did the FBI get involved in this? Uh, well, just to, to say one more thing, if you will, okay. about uh, Art Seal. Yeah, he was very brutal. He he was cold and callous. That that you could identify from his police days and what he did with Riso, uh, you know, aligns very well to, to that, that, that callousness. Um, the FBI got involved later the day. He he went he went missing from his driveway, and the authorities uh, at first thought he might have got sick and wandered off. So they did some field searches uh, in and around the area, wondering what what happened to him. It's actually a, a pretty interesting um, event on 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 how how. Because there was some some people that that said you know identified it right away, and I mentioned that in the book. The chief of the prosecutor's office once once he got called up that there was a missing executive, he came up, and then right away when he found out, you know, it's you, you're looking at the international president of Exxon, and he's he's disappeared. That he very quickly said, you know, this is a kidnapping. We, we need to call the FBI. However, the prosecutor wanted to hold off on that. He didn't want to. He didn't want to rush. Uh, to judgment. So they held off for a number of hours and did, um, you know, did some field uh, because it it was, he owned five acres. So there was woodland behind his property and adjacent to it. So they, they did some field searches, went uh, house to house inquiring what happened to him. Ultimately, uh, later that day, it's when the the phone call was made. uh, Chief Riley, uh, Richard Riley from the uh, the chief of the prosecutor's office in, in Morris County called the FBI. And that's how they were notified. Now, um, what, what was the what would have been the normal uh, Exxon Mobil procedure if he they had dropped their note there and, and said, "Hey, don't call the cops, don't call the FBI." Would Exxon have made the payoff quietly? A lot of times, these corporations try to keep law enforcement out of it, uh, but most of the time, when that happens, it's uh, it's uh, overseas, and law enforcement over there is not as reliable. And not as um, credible as law enforcement over here. 
So I would wager to say that they probably would have uh, involved the the police over here, uh, but they may not have because a lot of times they want they'd like to keep that out of the press. So um, they they were willing. He what happened? He was and it took a couple days before uh, or. And Jackie, her name was Jackie. Well, that was her nickname. Her real name was Irene, but uh, she went by the name Jackie. They, about two two or three days later, they send off a uh, a letter. They call Exxon hotline. They send off a letter saying, you, you'll find this note at such and such mall in, in New Jersey. It was uh, taped to a pole. And the note uh, was written as if it was an environmental extremist group that was holding him hostage. Again, they, they took that um, from the Victor Samuelson uh, kidnapping. So that's when that came. So initially, the authorities thought that they actually had a, a environmental extremist group uh, operating on U.S. soil. And if you recall that the Exxon Valdez was, I believe it was some, somewhere between 1990 and 1991. My, my memory is, is failing me on the exact time. But it was, it was just prior to, it might even been 89, just prior to this incident. This incident happened in 92. And it was still doing cleanup. I think right. it happened in 89. Um, so Exxon was really not looked upon too favorably when it came to the environment. Yeah, and that cleanup took years anyway, too. So what was the plan? Yeah. They, they left the note at the mall, the note they were supposed to leave at the crime scene, but they leave the note at the mall later on. Uh, so what, what What was the plan to pick up the money? Because back then they didn't have Bitcoin and all that kind of stuff like you could do nowadays. Uh, what did they, how did they plan this? <clears throat> well, what they did is they decided that they were going to have uh, Exxon. They, they thought they were dealing with the media representative from Exxon. They were going to have him they uh, the request was to put eighteen point five million dollars. At the time, it was the highest ransom request ever in U.S. history. To the, it, it still might be to this day, but at the time, it, it, it was the it was the biggest eighteen point five million dollars into ten um, Eddie Bauer bags, and it was specifically requested that they be Eddie Bauer bags. And that that kind of that kind of plays into the the story of. Or and Jackie Seal. Um, I guess the readers will have to read that out and figure why they were specific on Eddie Bauer bags. So they were going to put the money into the Eddie Bauer bags, and then and Exxon did release eighteen point five million dollars to them. So the FBI were in possession of eighteen point five million dollars. They put the money in the bags and they fit because he had a uh, a schematic to actually figure out how much money would fit in the bag. So the eighteen point five million fit into those 10 bags and then he was going to and there's actually two ransom nights because the first ransom night fails and it fails because she has a, a slight form of dyslexia dyslexia she dials the wrong number oh, no. the, the ransom night <laughs> so they yeah it's it, it is it's 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 really pitiful <laughs> They direct them to go to such and such a place in, in Morris uh, in Morris County, wait at a phone booth, because this is a time when phone booths were very prevalent, and phone booths play a part in this as well, because there's a lot of phone booths. And every phone, every when they did start doing phone calls, every phone call that they traced, the trapped and traced, came back to a pay phone. Okay. So when the FBI, under the guise that they were the Exxon uh, representative, waited at that phone booth, it, the, the phone call never came. That's because she dialed the wrong number. Okay. So uh, another week goes by with the, the kidnappers. And now, now keep in mind, the kidnappers did, don't realize that. They think that they requested for the Exxon rep representative to be at the phone booth. They called, and they, they never responded. Gotcha. So the kidnappers believe that the Exxon, Exxon failed, and, and, the, and the FBI, they, they're wondering, well, what happened? Did, did we get spotted? Did, did surveillance teams get... So they they both didn't know exactly what happened, and another week passed before they instituted contact again. And Okay, so, okay, so, so the first one fails because of a stupid mistake, you know, the, the dyslexia, like you said. But now, how, how about okay, plan B? Now, what, what about the next plan? What, what, what goes wrong now? The second attempt. The second attempt, they try to execute it in the same way. What they were going to do is they were going to go... 
from location to location, sending the FBI agents on a number of different stops that they have to go along the way, go to this phone booth at such and such place, wait for a phone call. Then they would send them to this place, and then they'd send them to that place, all, all with, uh, with the, um, the attempt to make the FBI think that they were being surveilled. And to some degree, they were being surveilled, but not by a large, it was just by a husband and wife team. Right. But the ultimate goal is to go from point to point to point to point to get them at a train station where they would catch the 10 o'clock train. They'd get on the 10 o'clock train with the 10 million dollars, uh, the 10 bags and the 18.5 million. And then they would, what they would do, because now this is a time, and this was, I found it a little hard to, to actually write about this. This is a time pre cell phone. And they had request, it was cell phones were just coming in. No one really had cell phones back then. The technology existed, but no one really had cell phones. And the kidnappers requested that they uh, obtain a cellular phone. And the reason being is they were going to put them on the, the train. And at each stop, they would drop off a bag of money, knowing that the FBI are not going to just leave a bag of such and such amount of, you know, millions of dollars. Um, on the side of uh, on the side of a train station, so they were thinking it would exhaust all the resources. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> yep, and then at the and and then at the last stop, you know, they would walk away with a bag or two. That's crazy. Yeah. No, so, no, no, no um, there's only two of them. First of all, how are they going to get ten bags over to the train station? Get get them on, go run them back and forth on the. People on the train are going to say, "Hey, what the hell's going on here?" There's people with ten bags, ten uh, giant eighty power bags. The whole idea is insane. Yeah, it it, it was insane. Um, but if if executed correctly, it may have worked because the 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 FBI they had about two hundred and fifty people out in the field. They were they were they were out on uh, Morris County and then the two other surrounding counties. Um, surveilling the phone booths because they knew the kidnappers uh, were, were making these calls via the phone booths. Yeah. So at the time, there was just so many phone booths out there. So believe it or not, there were 250 people out there. Still didn't, couldn't cover all the, the, the phone booths. So there was a couple agents would have, you know, two or three phone booths close to one another. And what they were doing is when the calls came in, because they were going point to point, the command center would say, you know, kidnappers are making a call. So the people doing the surveillance on the phone booth would try to say, is anyone making a phone call at my booth? Right. Uh, and that, and that ultimately worked. And that's how they got, that's how they ended up getting them. Uh, but not on the spot because then they actually lost them. And then it, it took, um, it took uh, a little twist in, in, in apprehending them. Um, but in theory, if they would have got them on the train, they would have exhausted the resources and they, they would have, been able to get a, get a, a bag or two. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> I gotta tell you, that sounds a, 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 like just crazy. Like, why wouldn't they just? I guess they they couldn't just stop the train because they still had the the the, the kidnap victim. Uh, I guess. But now, toward the end, there didn't Exxon say, "Hey, we want to see proof of life. Show us a picture of this guy that showed he's still alive." That that played out. Yes, that plays out during my narrative uh, on how that actually happened. And the first ransom night, the eighteen point five million dollars was actually in the bags. The second ransom night, it wasn't. It was just paper, cut oh, up, really? uh, cut up paper, because they failed to show proof of life because he died by then, and they were pretty sure that 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 there was no proof of life. That, so and he was dead. So the second the second ransom night, they were playing hardball. Uh, it was it was the it was it, it was an arrest. First ransom night, they were going to turn over the money and 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 you know, let them go and, and try to do the, uh, uh, you know, follow up with an investigation to try to get them. Wow. Okay. Now, so, and they, they caught them because they watched them at the payphone. They, they just happened to be at one of the payphones where they were making calls. A, a female FBI agent, uh, when the call came in at the kidnappers and making the phone call, happened to see a guy walk up to the phone booth. Uh, she didn't pay much attention to him because he, he looked normal. He was dressed kind of preppy. And, um, once um, once that call came out, the radio transmission came out. She she started paying attention to what he was doing. Once they said that, you know the kidnapper hung up, this guy ended his call. So that was she's like this is a little bit too coincidental. And then she observed him uh, go over to uh, a, a garbage bin and take off 
uh, latex gloves. Oh. So that's how they got him. Uh, in terms of they identified him as a suspect in the car, but then there were so many FBI agents and, and local law enforcement in the field. That, remember, Sidney Riesel was not found, so now they were like, okay, let's let's see let's see, see if we can follow him back. Maybe maybe get to uh, we can get Riesel. And so she didn't follow him, and they lost her. Okay, but the, I guess they traced him down. They had his plate number or something like that, right? Well, that that plays in because then it was a rental car. Okay. So miles, miles, and miles away in the opposite direction. Uh, it was described pretty well by Thomas Catone. He's an FBI agent, and and he was the, he was actually the case agent in in the beginning. But as time went on, he relinquished his case agent status. Because he it was too, it was becoming an, an administrative nightmare for him, and he wanted to just you know roll up his sleeves and get involved in the investigation. And th- that night of this second ransom, he was ordered to stay in the command post, which he was a little disappointed about because he actually wanted to you know be hands on uh, with the kidnappers. And he described it as like a triangle. You look at the command post in 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 one area, in one direction you got you got the, the, uh, where he was identified. Uh, or, you know, Art Steele in this, and they didn't know it was Art Steele at this time, but they got the kidnapper in this direction. And now it comes in, they lose him, now it comes back to a rented place all the way in, in Hackett's, uh, town, New Jersey. That's in the complete opposite direction from the, uh, the command center and, um, where they observed him. So they sent Tom Cantone out, and he was, he was, uh, annoyed about that as well, because now he's like, well, I want to be in a command center, at least take part in the, in the apprehension so I can see what's going on. And well, he was deployed out there to, to go to the rental company to, to figure out who rented the vehicle and they were going to raid the house. And Art Seal and his wife, Jackie, were, uh, decided to return the vehicle. And that's how they apprehended him at the rental company. And, and so this guy, the, the guy you're talking about, he apprehended them all by himself or he called him back? There were he he was there with a couple um, a, another FBI agent and uh, two local police officers. Okay. So it was the um, but it's, it's it's a pretty interesting how they how they bump into one another. It's it's not clearly that oh there he is. It's it, it's like oh, who's that? You know the guy trying to return a car. It's a pretty good story on how that unfolded as well. A lot of luck there, you think? A lot of luck, yes, because. It, it, you know, I, I spoke with Ed Peterson. He was he was primarily the main. He wasn't he wasn't the case agent, but he was the um, primarily the main agent working this case. He was the one that was proposing as the uh, Exxon uh, representative. Right. He says if they when they they buried they ended up burying resell down in the Pine Barrens, and he says two things: if if they would have after burying uh, resell, if they would have just said, you know what, we messed up. Let's just forget about it. They would they would have never solved the case. Risa would still be in the, buried in the Pine Barrens because DNA is not what it is today. It was just starting to uh, come. It had, it, it had yet to get tested uh, in in court. They had some uh, the envelope. They got some trace evidence in the envelope. They had a dog hair and they had a blonde female hair. But other than that, they had nothing. So if they really just abandoned what they were doing after they buried him, they would have got away with it. But also after, after um, he and, uh, and Jackie are apprehended, there is a, a point where they are interviewing Jackie and she wasn't cooperating. And then it comes to a point where he asked her about, you know, just at least tell us if, if he's alive or dead. Hmm. And, and she responded, probably dead. Which, which plays a role with exigent circumstances on, on how they search the one area. But she then stops and says, "Let me. I want to speak with my husband. And they were going to let her converse with him, figuring that would maybe uh, get her to cooperate a little bit more. But then the, uh, the local detective, uh, a man named Brian Dorg, who has since passed away, said you know no it's he's got a strong influence over her don't let her speak with him because he's going to tell her just to quiet down and if that would have happened they they probably wouldn't have been found guilty of um of the of this case they could have claimed that they were doing they were being a copycat 
that yeah, here's the here's the ransom letter. We didn't kidnap him. We're just we're just a copycat on on this on this case, and we were just trying to get some get some money. They would have they would have never been able to convict them uh, with the kidnapping and murder. That's so true. Oh, because this, this was on TV, right? I'm sorry. Because they because this was being on TV. It was in the news, right? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. copycats started coming out. So yeah. they and, and and that's exactly what Sue would have told him, told her, just say you know don't don't say anything. Or the the thing is we're gonna we're gonna say we were we we didn't you know we got greedy. We 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 figured we can we can get some money out of the deal. But but even then, so they they didn't have that story prepared uh, before they went out that night with their gloves and uh, making phone calls. They didn't have a plan back. They didn't say hey, we get pulled over, tell them you know, we're just copycats, right? They didn't even have that. Uh, again, you know, I found that when I was a trooper, you, we, I would do these investigations, yeah. and whether it be just a, a simple motor vehicle stop, where you know, if they go, you know, the drug runners. I worked on the turnpike for a while, so you get the drug runners going in and out of the city, yeah. and they would come up with a superficial plan. Uh, you know, we went in, uh, I saw my aunt, and then uh, you know, we stayed for three hours and we ha- went home. Okay, that's great. And then you start asking questions like, "What's the aunt's name? <laughs> Does the aunt own, own a house, or did, was it an apartment?" You know, and then they they start breaking down there because they don't plan the the the, the minor the the minor um, um, you know yeah. small stuff of their you know, good plan. So yeah, you're right. If they would have had a secondary, okay, here's what we're going to do. If we do get caught, we're gonna we're gonna claim we were copycats. Fascinating. Now, so then it was Jackie Irene who led them to the body to the burial site. Correct. Yes. And so then, without that, they, and so did she get a lesser sentence? She did. Okay. She did. She got, um, I, I believe it was a 20 year sentence. She got out in 18 years. Now, what would the difference have been in their sentences? I, cause I saw he got 95 years, right? Now, what, what if they had never shot this guy, if they had kept him alive? What would the, and, but they still got caught. What, what would the difference have been in their sentences? Well, I, I think the reason that his, his sentence was so, was so strict is the, the way he treated uh, Sidney Rizzo. Yes. And, and and on top of that, uh, the aggravating circumstances were uh, his captivity, how he was he was held uh, captive, and then thereafter continuing on, even though he, he he had expired, continuing on with with the torment, saying that you you know you're gonna they were there's a, several letters that came out that we're gonna kill him mm-hmm. uh, if you don't comply, you, you know he's still alive. And so it, it it was really aggravating for, towards the um, an aggravating factor on the um, how unsympathetic they were to the Riso family. Yeah, just imagine, you know, you're 57 years old, you're out of shape as it is. I just had hernia surgery, you know. So when you're 57 years old, things are falling apart anyway. Now you got a gunshot wound, that your arm is swollen up, and you're they're stuck in this little tiny box with your own crap, and your own the urine. You're not being fed. You can't breathe. I just what a horrible, horrible way to die. You know, the guys must have been uh, having panic attacks in there, scratching away at the walls. You can only imagine, you know, uh, uh, how horrible this is. Now, both of these two, they're still alive, right? These two, uh, uh, the convicted, right? The kid. Yeah, she got she got out in in uh, 2010. She's a free woman now, uh, but he's you know he's behind bars for the rest of his life. I I I sent several requests out to him to interview him he he didn't respond yeah. i do believe that he's not doing well though uh, and i base that on the fact that they he's in a federal um prison but they moved him to the medical facility mm. so i i suspect he's probably not doing well he's around 72 years old right now oh boy okay and now uh, irene uh, jackie as you say uh w- do we know what she's doing now that she's out <laughs> She uh, was on probation for a number of years, and um, you know what? I don't. I, I do know where she is, and I think I mentioned it in the book. I don't. Re- I don't recall uh, exactly. I think she's out with her daughter. Okay. Fascinating story, my friend. Anything else you want to uh, leave us with the uh, with the story here? The uh, what is it? millions? Uh, uh, mystery. Mystery millions and murder in North Jersey. Yeah. The kidnapping of uh, Exxon uh, executive Sidney Reese. So. Any, anything else about uh, that that you want to tell us? No, I, I think that I think we basically covered it. It's, it's yeah. a good story. It's uh, it's a it's a true crime narrative. Uh, I it, but you if you read between the lines, you can actually see some situational 
awareness uh, things in here. You know, victims, and I have to tell you, you know, um, victims, there's a, there's a number of things that people do that make themselves targets and, and victims and a lot of things that they, they do and a lot of things they fail to do. And uh, in the methodology of these, these individuals that prey upon the weak, if you will, uh, also follow a, a certain uh, uh, methodology. And uh, it's it's clearly in the narrative. You you, you could see the mistakes that uh, that uh, you know Sidney Russo made, and you also see the the, the planning phase and, and and what they did and, and the mistakes that they made along the way. So I, I think it's a good read. It's uh, it's a, it's sad because the, when I researched this book, I really uh, uh, come to know you know got to know Sidney Russo, and he was a, he was a good man. had a, had a family. He and his wife. We're at that age where, where, you know, you start thinking about retiring and uh, taking it a little bit easier, what they were going to do. They had uh, their, their children, uh, you know, spending time with grandchildren. So they were really starting to think about their next phase in life. And it was uh, tragically taken away from them because of greed. Did you get the opportunity so, uh, to talk to anybody in the Riso family, like the wife or the kids or anybody? Uh, it was such a traumatic incident. Yeah. I did uh, on the phone, but it's such a traumatic, uh, 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 traumatic incident for them that they didn't want to uh, participate in this in this narrative. And I, I understand that. Yeah, I know that 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 feeling, that experience. You contact these poor people, uh, you know, and, and you know, and you want them to tell their story, but sometimes they just can't. They just can't. Uh, they don't want to go back there and face that again. So now, you, no, it's, you, it's, 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 you know, what? In, in addition to that, I, I realized too, that Sydney and, and Patricia, they had lost a son uh, a few years before this incident. And in the years that passed, uh, Patricia, so poor, poor Patricia, she lost a son, she lost her husband uh, and then she lost another son and then she lost a son-in-law. So, you know, I, and then, you know, and then you got this phone call coming from, from this, uh, this author in New Jersey wants to write about the case. Yeah. And I, I just, I think it's a little bit too much and they, you know, they don't want to read, they've had some really tragedy in their life and they want to stay away from it. I don't blame them. No, I don't blame them either. Now you, you pick such great topics. This is a great, this, there should be a movie out of this one. Here's a great topic here. And the, and the previous one, Richard Beganwald, no one's written about him either. Uh, what, what do you got coming up next? What's your next plan? I have a fiction book that's already written uh, out. It's uh, uh, I'm, I'm venturing into this is my first fiction book. It's about a PI. I'm sticking with the traditional formula. All the research I've said says don't reinvent the wheel. It's about a PI working uh, in the city of Hoboken, New Jersey, uh, on a corruption case. And uh, the, the one thing that I did do is I made the, the PI a, a, a former New Jersey state trooper, a um, a, a vocation I'm, I'm obviously very familiar with. So that's that's my next thing that's coming out, and I am researching um, what I'm going to do uh, next in terms of what true crime case am I going to write about. So I'm in that process now of uh, identifying a case that I, I feel is uh, is worthy of uh, of my of my time to you know spend a, a year or two doing research on. So so you've gone from uh, Richard Beganwall. A notorious serial killer uh, to these these uh, horrific uh, kidnappers, and then you, you're ending up on the lowest of the low, a PI, <laughs> scraping the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> Listen, John, uh, John O'Rourke, man, I can't thank you enough. How can people get a hold of you if they want to follow what you're doing? Besides going to John E O'Rourke dot com, uh, you can follow me on Facebook, uh, John E O'Rourke, and you can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at uh, J O R Author. John, thank you so much. As soon as the next book comes out, give me a call. Put your head on the air, okay, man? And I appreciate it. It's always uh, great talking to you. I appreciate your help. You pick the greatest topics, man. I, I love the stuff you pick. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, thank you. Okay, so there we had John E. O'Rourke. You go to johneorourke.com. Uh, you can meet him in person at uh, Madison, New Jersey on the 13th at the Short Stories Bookstore. Uh, this book we're talking about today is Mur Mystery, Millions, and Murder in North Jersey. Okay. Mystery, Millions, and Murder in North Jersey. And the previous one is the Richard Beganwald story, uh, the Jersey Shore thrill killer, richardbeganwald.com. I got that in my uh, member section, as a matter of fact, the Richard Beganwald. And I think I told um, my story uh, about meeting Richard Beganwald. I met Richard Beganwald in a house, in his mother's house, where he had dead bodies buried there. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, maybe I'll do a whole segment. I'll tell that whole story. Thank you so much, John O'Rourke, johneorourke.com and all his wonderful books. Good night.